Before we begin coding, it's important that we consider how we're going to make this work efficiently. You might naively attempt to count the number of living neighbours surrounding each cell every generation to decide which rule you'll apply to each cell. That will work, sure, but it's a lot of calls and a lot of lost efficiency. Hmm, let's try something else. How about instead, we store the number of neighbouring cells that each cell has? So when we first randomly or otherwise set a cell as alive, we do two things. First, we set this cell as alive, as intended. But the second thing we do is increase the living neighbour counts of its eight neighbours. Then, when we move on to calculating the next generation, all we do is iterate through each cell that either has neighbours or is alive and check how many neighbours it has. This doesn't require a calculation since each cell stores the number of neighbours, so it's really quick to just fetch that value. Besides, we don't even need to iterate over the majority of cells since most cells will be both dead and have no neighbours, so it couldn't possibly change state in the next generation. What's even better is that our program will get faster the further through the simulation we go, because the number of cells we can skip increases. This is because the number of dead cells with no neighbours, the ones we skip, increases from the first generation until it reaches an equilibrium. We now know how we're going to implement it, and we'll come back to that as we're writing the program, since there are some additional optimizations we can do. Before that, how are we going to represent our grid? What data structures should we use? Well, we know that now that we need to store two things about every cell. One, is the cell alive or dead? And two, the number of living neighbour cells. To be efficient, we should also try and use as little memory as we can, so let's consider each of these variables in turn. The cell's alive or dead state is just a boolean type, either a 1 or a 0, so we can store it in a single bit of memory. The number of living neighbour cells will be an integer that can have a maximum value of 8, since a cell can have a maximum of 8 living neighbours. In binary, 8 is represented by 1000 and hence we need 4 bits of memory to store the number of living neighbours for each cell. Therefore, in total, we need just 5 bits of memory for each cell. But wait a minute, in C++, the smallest types are bool and char, which are both a byte, 8 bits in size, so we need a way of storing both the cell state and the number of living neighbours in one of these types. There's no way we can store both values in a boolean variable, but since the char can store numbers, we could use some bitwise manipulation to store our two variables inside one unsigned char. This way, we're only wasting three bits of memory. So here's how our 8-bit unsigned char will look for each cell. The zeroth bit will store our cell state, and the next four bits, that's from the first to the fourth bit inclusive, will hold the number of living neighbours surrounding that cell. The fifth to seventh bits will have to be unused, however. There's nothing we can really use it for. That's about as efficient as we can get with memory usage, but maybe there's something else I've missed that we'll catch later on. Storing our data in this way will actually lead to another optimization in speed. Before, we were going to iterate over all our cells, skipping over those that had no neighbours and were dead. We check this by using the and and operator to compare the two arrays for the state and neighbour counts. Since we no longer need two arrays, and we're just using one unsigned char array, we know that if a cell has no neighbours and is dead, the first bit, its state, will be zero. The neighbour count will also be zero. And since we're not using the remaining three bits, the whole unsigned char will be zero. So all we have to do to check if the cell has no neighbours and is dead is to check if the char equals zero. In other words, is it a zero byte? Now we're well aware of how our implementation will work and how we will store our data, it's time to start coding. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is set up our graphics library. I'm going to be using SDL, so that's what I'll be setting up, and I'll try and keep this bit really quick, and I'll skip over some of it since you might want to use a different graphics library and it's not really relevant to the video. Okay, and one other thing we actually need to do that involves STL and every other graphics library you might want to, want to use 
is a function for drawing pixels because this is going to depend on the size of our, our cells. So we're going to actually have an unsigned int here called cell size and we'll set it to one for now but it represents the width and the height of your cell in pixels so this actually depends on your this doesn't depend on anything but it will influence your screen width and height so we should really be defining this before that up here and we'll also need a cell map width and cell map height so cell map width, we'll set it as 200 for now. And cell map height. And that will also be 200. And these three variables here will determine our screen width and height. So screen width will be our cell map width multiplied by the cell size. Similarly, screen, map, screen height is our cell map height multiplied by our cell size. And that should make logical, logical sense. So now we need a function for drawing cells, so we'll call it void draw cell. So for this function, what we we'll need to take in is an x position, a y position, and a color. In my case, I'm using black or white, which are 255 and 0 um, for both RG, for all of RG and B, so I only, only need to set one variable. But you might want to use different colors, so you'll want to set an R, G, and B variable. So we'll want a pointer to our pixel array. And uh, most graphics libraries will have this, and if you want to do pixel manipulation, you do have to handle a pixel array. And we want a pointer, so we'll need the star. And since it only stores numbers from 0 to 255, we can just use uint 8. Well, it's surface pixels, which is how we fetch our pixel array. And we need to find our index here, which is done by doing y times the cell size multiplied by the screen width plus x times the cell size. And this is the formula used generally for indexing a 2D array into a one-dimensional array but we also have to multiply this by 4 and that's because this particular pixel array stores the four parts of a pixel contiguously so R, G, B and alpha and that's why we have to multiply it by 4 it might be different for your graphics library and then because we're using a cell size we have to iterate through it and draw multiple cells for multiple pixels for one cell so we'll start with i equals 0 i less than the cell size I plus plus and we'll need J as well J plus plus and for this we'll be setting R, G and B to the color that we passed in so that's pixel pointer plus J times 4 equals our color and we'll have to repeat that for the next two as well. So plus one and plus two. So that sets the red, green, and blue values to 255 if I've set it to white, or zero if I've set it to black. And then we need to get to the next row of the pixel, uh, pixel array. So that's done by incrementing our pixel pointer by the width of our screen. multiplied by 4 because RGBA. There's four memory locations required for each pixel in this array. Okay, now we can move on to actually creating our cell map. And this requires creating our own class for the cell map that will store everything we want to know about it. So we'll call it class cell map. And for public, we'll need our constructor, which will take in the width and the height of our cell map, which will be the cell map width and cell map height we defined up there, but it's easy to just store it in here anyway. We'll need a destructor for deallocating our dynamically allocated arrays, which we'll be using for our unsigned jar array. And 
and uh, yeah, insert our private variables. So we'll need our unsigned char array for our cells. We'll also want a second one called temp cells. And this is for copying over when we're calculating the next generation without altering our original array. We'll want to store our width and our height as well as the length of the whole array, which is just width times height. Okay, let's define some of these. Let's define our constructor first. Here we can actually use our initializer list. So we'll set w as width and h as height. And then in here we can say our length equals w times h. And we can dynamically allocate our array here too. So we have cells equals new unsigned char, which is the same as the length. And similarly for our temp cells array too. There we go. And we'll want to set this to zero initially because we're not using bits five to seven, so they might be set to something else initially and we we'll want to make sure that everything's zero. We need to include memory for that. Okay, and now the destructor. And for this, all we have to do is deallocate. So what we call new on, we have to delete. So that's delete, delete cells, and delete temp cells. And now we can get our first function running, which will be set cells. So we can actually test this by randomly assigning cells. So void set cell. And for this, we want to know our x position and our y position for this particular cell. And we'll define it down here. So we will need a pointer to the position in our array where we want to set our cell. So we'll need an unsigned jar, call it cell pointer. And that indexes in using the formula we used before. So y times width plus x, and that's how you index a 2D array into a one-dimensional array. That gives us the position that we want to go to. And to set the cell as on is simple. We take our pointer and we OR it with 1. So that sets the first bit as 1, which means turning it on. And we're forgetting something, and that's that we have to increment the neighbor counts of all the surrounding neighbor cells. So to do this, we'll have to calculate some offsets. And uh, all the surrounding cells have to be calculated. So we'll need x left, x right, y above, and y below. And uh, we need to calculate them because we'll be using Pac-Man edges, I suppose you could call it, where if you go off the left side of the screen, you'll come back on the right. If you go off the top, you'll come back on the bottom, and vice versa. So to do that, we need to calculate each offset and that means checking if the cell that we're setting is on is at the border or not. Because if it's not at the border, then the calculation is very simple. x left is just minus 1, x right is plus 1, y above is minus 1, y below, y below is plus 1. But if it's at the border, then we need to calculate it using the length and width of our array. So here's how we do that. We'll do it just underneath. So if x is equivalent to 0, or if we're at the left border, then what we want to do is set x left as w minus 1, width minus 1. That's what we're adding on to get to that x left item, because it's going to be on the right side of the screen, because it's wrapping around. Otherwise, it's very simple. It's just minus 1, like I said. And we have to do this for everything, so we'll do x right next. So in this case, if x is equivalent to w minus 1, that's if the cell we're looking at is on the right edge of the screen, then our x right will actually be on the left edge of the screen. Yeah, that's just going to be minus w minus 1 is the calculation we need to make to get there. Remember, these are offsets, so we're adding these on to get to this position. And if not, it's just plus 1, so it's just 1. And now we need to do it for y, which is very similar. So if y equals 0, that is, if we're at the top edge of the screen, then our y above 
is going to equal our length minus w to get to the bottom of the screen, else our y above is just minus w because we're still using a one-dimensional array, so we have to minus the whole width to go up one row. And then uh, in the other case, where if we're at the bottom of edge of the screen, that's if y is equivalent to our height minus one, then our y below has to be uh, the negative of the length minus our width. And that's to get from the bottom of our screen to the top of the screen from where we are. Else, it's simply w, because we have to add that on to go down a row. Okay, now we actually have to set each of these. We've calculated our offsets, and now we have to actually increment the neighbors, the neighbor counts of the neighbors by one. So we'll start with the top left corner and then move around. So that would be y above plus x left, that gives us a top left corner. And we have to actually add 2 on to this. We have to add 2 on because we're starting from the first bit, not the zeroth bit, and moving onwards up to the fourth bit. So it's very similar for the rest, so I'll skip this bit. Okay, now that we've done that, we know how to set a cell, and we can just copy and paste this code to clear a cell too, because we're going to be doing the exact same thing, the only difference is we're going to be setting it as off instead, and we're going to be minusing two. So to do that, let's just set our uh, clear cell, so it's just going to have the exact same parameters, and we can just copy, our, copy and paste our other code. Up here, and we'll have to get our new one. So clear cell and paste it in. And the only difference here, of course, oh, we forgot to say it's part of the class. There we go. And the only difference here is we're unsetting it, so we're toggling it as off, so we can just put not here and and equals here. And that will be setting it as zero or off or dead. And then we just minus equals 2 to de-increment our neighbor counts in all our neighboring cells. And there's one more thing we need to do before we move on to calculating the next generation. And that is a way to initialize our cell map. So we we'll want an init function, I suppose, to randomly set a certain number of cells as on. And this can be done by creating an init function. And we, we won't need any parameters for this, unless you want to pass in the percentage of cells you want to set us on. You might want to do that, but you can edit that yourself. So to do that, we'll create a new function, cell map init. Okay, for setting our cell map init function, all we have to do is let's create a seed first, and this prevents us from getting the same distribution of cells every single time. So this will be taking in unsigned time and we'll use the current time and you need to import c time to get time uh, yeah and now we'll set the seed so srm seed and we want to use our for loop to determine what percentage of cells we want to set as alive so we'll start i off at well we'll start from zero and we want to do it while i is less than our width times our height, which gets us the number of cells we've got, or actually we could just use length since we've already got that calculated, multiplied by the percentage of cells we want to set us on, so we'll, let's say 50%, and yeah, we'll increment i, and then we can just do x equals rand mod our width minus 1. Y equal, that gives us a number between 0 and width minus 1. So y equals mod rand mod h minus 1. And I forgot to define x and y. There we go. And then all we have to do here is set it using our set function. So we set cell x 
Y. And that sets it as on or alive. But we don't want to do that for every single cell because sometimes you, we might end up randomly selecting the same cell and we don't want to set it as on twice. So first we want to check if it's on and that means creating a function to return the status of each cell. So to do that, we'll create a new function up here called cell state that'll re return an int to get us the function get us the status of each cell so get the state of each cell whether it's alive or not and we'll need an x and y position for that too there we go and we'll create that here and as before we'll need our pointer and to return the status of a cell is really, really simple. All that needs is we get our cell and we and it with one that returns the first bit and that's all we have to do. So we can use that down here to check if our cell's already been set as on. So we get our cell state of x, y. And if it's not on, then we'll set it as on. And there we go, that's our random initialization function. So what we can do at this point is create an object for our map. So we'll create a cell map down here. So cell map, and we'll call it map. And we need to initialize it with our width and our height. So we'll type that in now. Then underneath that, we need to make sure we have our initialization function. So cell map map.init. Okay, now we've done that, there's only one thing left to do, and that is calculate the next generation. And we'll need a new function for that, so we'll have to set that up in our class. We won't need to get anything from it since we're already storing our cell, cell array. So let's just create our function underneath all this. Void next gen, now that part of the class. So for this, we will be iterating over the whole array and skipping where necessary. So we can uh, define our variables here, x, y, and we'll need something to store our neighbor counts when we're iterating through, so we'll call it live neighbors. And we'll need our pointer, once again, to point to our array, so we'll call it cell ptr. And we'll copy our cells array into our temp cells array so that we can make alterations while holding on to what we've already got. That's length. Okay, so we'll start by pointing to the first element in the array. We're going to iterate by column because this makes things a little easier when it comes to skipping cells. So we'll start with y equals zero and y less than h. And y plus plus. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use a while loop to iterate through x. So we'll make it a do while loop. And the condition for when we exit this do while loop is when x, which gets incremented as we do this, is less than the width. So essentially it's a for loop. But the reason we're using a do while loop here is because we're going to have to skip cells that are dead and have no neighbors. So we'll do the skipping here. We'll skip first to make things quick. So while our cell pointer, or the place it's pointing to, the value is equivalent to zero, our zero byte. Then we want to increment our cell pointer because we want to look at the next item, and what we want to do here is check if when we increment x, since we're going on to the next item, our x value is equivalent to w. It won't be greater than, but this is a safety. Then we'll have to use an elusive go to. And this is one of those rare cases where using a go to is actually faster than anything else. There may be a way you can use a continue statement here if you put the do while loop inside a function, but this is just easier to read. So 
So at the end of the for loop, we're going to have to put a statement here after we put semicolon here called next row. So we've got a label that it can skip to. And then that's how we skip through every single cell really quickly. Next part is determining the on off state of cells that do either have neighbors or are on. So the first thing we can do is get the number of live neighbors. And that's very simple. That's using a logical shift of one to the right. And that moves our neighbor count down to the zeroth bit up to the third bit. So that's the actual value we're getting. And it makes the uh, cell state go into the carry bit. So we can just ignore that. And then we can check if our cell is on by ending with one, because we're checking the first bit. And if it is on, we need to check if it stays on. And that's only if it has exactly two or three neighbors that are alive. So we check if count is not equal to two and if count is not equal to three, then we can turn it off. No, we're not using count here, are we? Live neighbors. And if that's the case, then we can clear this cell and give our x and y. And we can draw the cell, but in the off color, which in my case is black, which is zero. And then else, which means cells that are off, we have to check if they turn on this generation. So that's just if there are exactly three neighbors. And then we can set the cell, x, y, and draw x, y in the on color, which for me is 255. Then we need to make sure we are incrementing our cell pointer when it's moving on to the next iteration. So we're continuing moving on. And that should be it for setting our cells. Now we can test this once we've added our next gen function into our main loop. And there we go, it's working as expected, but it's very small. Let's make this a bit bigger. Well, we, we could keep 200. We'll increase our cell size so it's much clearer to see. If we make it four, then we're going with 800 by 800, which is a bit too big, actually. It's off my screen. Let's make it three. There we go, going extremely quick too. And I'm using recording software, so that's gonna make it a lot slower. Okay, that's it for this video. Thanks a lot for watching. The source code is available in the description. And if you want it to look even cooler, you can add a delay of 50 milliseconds or so using SDL or the Windows library. Any kind of delay would work between each frame. That lets you see the movement much more clearly.